Hello, my name is Chris Perry. I'm an economist and I'm particularly interested in how economics and water, and particularly how farmers use water, interact with one another and how economics can explain some of the behaviours that farmers adopt when faced by different incentives. Today I'm going to talk about Jevons' paradox. Jevons was an economist in the 1800s and his particular interest, which is what I'm going to talk about initially today, was steam engines and coal. And his paradox related to how the demand for coal changed as steam engines became more efficient in its use. The first example of a steam engine I can find is from some 2,000 years ago. All the components of every steam engine are there. Some fuel is burned, heat is generated, water is boiled, and steam is used to generate some form of mechanical motion. In this case, there wasn't a lot of power, but the theory was demonstrated. Only 1700 years later, steam engines have become a fundamental part of the Industrial Revolution, generating the power that industry needed to improve its rates of production. This example, from about 1700, managed to convert about 0.5% of the energy in the fuel into mechanical energy. A very useful quantity of energy, providing one had enough coal. A hundred years later, this engine generated five times as much energy per unit of coal burned and was fundamental to the Industrial Revolution in the UK. So the question then arose amongst economists was that if we now only needed one fifth of the coal to generate a unit of mechanical energy, what would happen to the demand for coal? Many assumed that the demand for coal would collapse. Far less would be needed to meet society's requirements for energy. Jevons argued exactly the opposite. He said that as energy became cheaper because less coal was needed to produce it, the demand for the energy would increase very rapidly as new uses and expansions for existing uses developed, and hence overall the demand for coal would increase. As we can see from this graph, Jevons was entirely correct. Demand for coal in the UK in 1700 was about 2 million tonnes per year. A hundred years later, it was 10 million tonnes per year, five times as much. And by 1900, the demand for coal was more than a hundred times what it had been only 200 years earlier. How does this all translate to irrigation? Again, a similar argument is underway. The conventional wisdom is that irrigation is wasteful, far less water should be used by farmers if only they adopted better technology, demand would fall, the world would be saved and all our rivers would flow safely again. Well, as we compare these two sorts of uh, irrigation, we see on the left traditional so-called inefficient irrigation. Water is visible in the canal. It's also visible outside the canal and it is visible lying all over the field. The crop doesn't look very happy. By contrast, with the modern irrigation system on the right, we can't see any water because all of the water is being delivered direct to the roots of the plant and is being used to produce a very vigorous and valuable looking crop. Applying Jevons', applying Jevons arguments to this, one would expect that as technology has improved over the decades, demand for water would increase rather than fall. And indeed, when we look at evidence from around the world, from the western United States to the east of China, we see everywhere that aquifers are collapsing as demand for water has increased and farmers are able to pump from ever deeper levels because the water is more valuable to them and hence they are ready to spend more money, devote more resources to obtaining it. 
Rivers are in no better shape. Many of them are polluted, and in extreme cases, we find a site such as this. Fish, decades old, never having experienced such shortage of water before, in a mass death. That is the economic construct of, De of Jevons. As the input becomes more valuable, the demand for the input increases. But in the case of water, it is even more complicated. The inefficient steam engine was only capturing a small amount of the heat generated by burning the coal. The rest of the heat was going to waste, and as the steam engine technology improved, more of that waste heat was captured, more of it turned into mechanical energy, and hence the ratio of output mechanical energy to input coal improved, while the quantity of waste heat fell. Water is rather different. At the farm scale, we see all the inputs of water from rainfall, from irrigation and so on, arriving at the farm. From the farmer's point of view, everything that goes off of the farm as runoff or deep percolation to an aquifer is a loss, and he would like to capture that water, which is what he does, with high-tech irrigation in order to improve his production per unit of water delivered to the farm. But if we now look at that farm in the context of the basin, we see that these return flows are not losses. They go back into the system and frequently are a source of water for somebody else. To sum up, Jevons argued that as steam engines became more efficient in producing mechanical power for every unit of coal consumed, the demand for coal would not fall, but rather it would rise because additional uses would be found for that mechanical power. He was right. The demand for coal increased dramatically just as the efficiency of steam engines was increasing. The same arguments are taking place over water. It is argued that if we improve the productivity of water, new crops, different varieties, more precise irrigation, more fertilizer, and so on, we can make do with less water. But that is not how it works. When the farmer finds that his input of water is more productive or can be made more productive, as then as long as he is short of water, he will continue to demand more and he will do that by pumping deeper, diverting more, and generally minimizing any outflows from his land. That is what we see happening worldwide. And there's a second dimension to this. In the case of steam power, the wasted heat was just waste. It went to the atmosphere and produced no benefit. That is not the case with water. Irrigation and all water resources use takes place in the context of a basin, and any excess water does not just disappear, it returns somewhere to the system. And if it returns to a river, or if it returns to an aquifer, then in all probability somebody else is benefiting from the use of that water. This has important implications. We cannot promote improved irrigation technology or improved cropping systems as long as farmers have uncontrolled access to water. If we do, water systems will collapse. The initiative that has to be taken first is by government, and it consists of controlling access to water. Why is it so hard to promote this sequence of interventions when the evidence is so clear? The participants in this process give us some clues. Each of them prefers the status quo. The alternative option of taking difficult political decisions, taking water away from farmers, slowing loans for development, and not having much to talk about in conferences, academic papers, or in consultancies, is not particularly attractive. So what is the alternative? If politicians can be persuaded to take the difficult decisions that they face to make water use consistent with the sustainable and renewable supply, they will find, as has been the case everywhere where this is practiced, that farmers are the most remarkable innovators. They find extraordinary ways to maintain production 
and maintain their incomes. They adopt new crops, they adopt new technologies, and they do so because it makes sense in relation to the available water supply. And this in turn will allow the rest of us to enjoy the beauties that a sustainable water environment can provide. Thank you. Thank you.